All right, so I'm sure this is a change of pace you guys probably did or did not see coming, but I bought Chess Ultra on the PS5 because I've kind of really gotten into it. So we are going to go ahead and learn about how chess works. And I'm looking forward to this because um, when I played when I played real chess 3D on the, on the phone and I won a round after like trying out 20 rounds, I decided, you know what? Chess really is a good and good and healthy sport. And yes, chess actually is an Olympic sport. So let's go ahead and learn. Dude. I remember this music. I remember this music. You know, I used to listen to this very music when I did my schoolwork back when I was homeschooled. I'm not even kidding. I would turn this on because I was the kind of kid who liked... I'm the kind of kid who liked to play music that would help you think and like help your brain. And... I... Oh, wow. Everything is coming full circle. Alright, let's learn. Highlight an individual piece by moving the cursor. Select the piece to take control of it. You will notice the cursor changes. Legal moves the piece may perform. Legal moves the piece may perform are highlighted. To move a piece you are in control of, select one of the highlighted squares with the cursor. Try moving this piece now to any legal square. So we currently have control of the queen. Yeah, see, we, uh... We can really have a better look at everything here. So... We can go pretty much anywhere. So we'll go here. Wait, do I... How do I... Oh, okay, so that like changes the angle. Oh, okay. Cool. No, I... How, how do I move it? Okay, that pauses the game. Oh! Alright. Rooks, also sometimes called castles because that's what they look like, are the easiest of all the pieces to understand. They can move forward or backwards or side to side and can travel as many spaces as they like as long as the path is not blocked by another piece. Rooks cannot jump over other pieces. And what it means by jumping over other pieces is it cannot jump over another piece to continue on its merry way. There, I think there's a difference between jumping over a piece and capturing it. The rook is the second most powerful piece. You will begin the game with two rooks in each of the corner squares, and they provide a powerful attacking tool due to the distance they can cover. Oh, okay. 
So I select it and then choose a square. Bishops can be moved diagonally in any direction. Like the rook, it can travel as many spaces as it likes as long as the path is not blocked by another piece. Bishops cannot jump over other pieces. Each player starts with two bishops. The bishop does very well in open positions on long diagonals, but less well when it is blocked in. Yeah. The queen. The queen has the powers of the rook and the bishop combined. She can be moved in a straight line in any direction and can travel as many spaces as she likes as long as the path is not blocked by another piece. The queen cannot jump over other pieces. The queen is most powerful and vers The queen is the most powerful and versatile piece on the board. You only get one queen at the start of a game, so use her wisely and she will serve you well. Early in the game, it is best to be cautious. Yeah, if you lose your queen, your chances of winning have redi- redi- <clears throat> Your chances of winning have been reduced by a significant amount. The king can move one square in any direction. The king cannot move into a position which puts him, which puts him directly in danger. The king cannot jump over other pieces. The king is your most valuable piece, so protect him at all costs. His downfall will cost you the game. One of your most important jobs early in the game will be to make a safe shelter for your king. Try moving the king now to any legal space. So, the king, I don't think he can actually capture any pieces. So, he kind of just is the piece to protect. The pawn. Pawns can only move forward. Their first move can be forward one or two squares. All subsequent moves after their first are limited to one move forward. Pawns cannot jump over other pieces. You begin each game with eight pawns, and they serve as your first line of defense, but that you will learn later they hold a few surprises up their sleeves. It is nearly always a good idea to place pawns in the center of the board early in the game. The knight. The knight hops in an L shape in any direction. Remember it as two squares in one direction and then one square sideways. Knights are the only piece on the board that can jump over other pieces. The knight hops around and this special movement makes it a very important and difficult piece. So when it says L shape, yeah like this. One, one, two, L, one, two, L, 1, 2, L, 1, 2, L, and so on and so on. The Rook. To capture an opponent piece with a Rook, you should move your Rook to the square in which the opponent piece is situated. Remember, Rooks can only move forwards, backwards, left, or right, and cannot jump over other pieces. Now, when they say they can only move forwards and backwards... Wait. Oh, I'm stupid. The Rook, the castle. Always look for opportunities to place your Rooks in open columns, also known as files. An open file is a file which does not have any pawns on it. Try capturing any of the pieces on the board with your Rook. We'll go for the queen. Trophy earned. Chop wood. The bishop. To capture an opponent piece with a bush, uh, bishop, you should move your bishop to the square in which the opponent piece is situated, as you do with any piece. 
Remember, bishops can only move diagonally and cannot jump over pieces. The bishop does very well in open positions on long diagonals, but less well when it is blocked in. Like so. To capture an opponent piece with a queen, you should move your queen to the square in which the opponent piece is situated. Remember, the queen can move in any direction, but cannot jump pieces. The queen is a very strong attacking piece, but early in the game it is best to be cautious. The queen becomes much stronger after some minor pieces have been exchanged. Try capturing any of the pieces on the board with your queen. To capture an opponent piece with the king, you should move your king to the square in which the opponent piece is situated. Remember, the king can move in any direction, but only by a single square. In the opening and middle game stages, getting the king safe is very important. Countless games have been lost, even by very strong players when they have forgotten this simple rule. Try capturing any of the pieces on the board with your king. Oh, so it can capture. Did I say before it couldn't? Hmm. You see this? You see how I can't move to some of these? That is because... Something it didn't mention about... Actually, I, I think it might mention it about the rook. Uh, not the rook, the pawn. But if it doesn't, I'll bring it up. But... The reason it can't move to some of these spots will soon make sense. The pawn. Pawns have unique rules when it comes to capturing opponent pieces. Pawns capture by moving one square forward, but this time diagonally to the left or to the right. Oh, so it does bring it up. So the reason I couldn't move to some of the squares as king is because it would have moved the king to a square where a pawn could move diagonally to capture it. It can only happen if a pawn is diagonal away f from a king or any piece. The pawn is the only chess piece which captures in a different way to its, to its ordinary move. <clears throat> Try capturing any of the pieces on the board with your pawn. Like so. To capture an opponent piece with a knight, you should move your knight to the square in which the opponent piece is situated. Remember, knights move in an L-shaped fashion and can jump over other pieces. Knights are very useful in blocked positions and are at their best when they are near the center. Alright, let's try capturing any of the pieces on the board with the knight. Place a white knight on E6. Well, that's specific. Each square of the chessboard is identified by a unique coordinate pair consisting of a letter and a number. The files go up the board and are labeled A through H. The horizontal rows of squares are called ranks and are numbered 1 to 8 starting from white side of the board. The beauty of this grid-like system is that every square on the board has a name of its own, and because every square has its own name, it is very easy to describe a move. As well as the squares on the board, the pieces also have notation. B is for bishop, R is for rook, Q is for queen, K is for king, and N is... Uh, okay, yeah, N is for knight. I guess, you know, because K is for king. Make the move BF6. Okay, so... Like this?
BF6. Oh, F6. I'm stupid. Capturing pieces is also notated. Capturing a piece is represented by an X. Make the move QX E5. Oh. You know, I think I have actually seen these terms before, but I never really understood them. The king is your most important piece. If your king is captured, you lose the game. When your king is under direct attack, it is referred to as check. Check is represented on the board as a line of attack in red. You cannot leave your king under threat. If your king is in check, you must leave check with your move. To do this, you can perform three key reactions. Move away, block the attacking piece, or capture the attacking piece. Try moving your king out of check now. Blocking check. The king is your most important. Okay, yeah. You cannot. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. It's just talking about the same three things. So we attack it. Don't worry, you'll eventually understand the game as we play. The ultimate aim in chess is to trap the opponent's king. If every possible move results in the king remaining in check, then this is checkmate and the game is over. Try to solve this chess puzzle. Checkmate in one move is possible. Can you find the solution? Hmm, okay. Alright, where's the king? That's the king right there. Checkmate in one move is possible. Is it? Checkmate in one move is possible. You know, I've come across a situation like this. <gasps> Wait. Oh. Could this be it? <gasps> it is. <laughs> oh. I'm smart. By now you will have noticed that the different chess pieces have all different ways of moving. All have different ways of moving. These differences make some pieces more powerful and therefore more valuable than others. The va this value is measured in pawns. The values are as follows. Knight is 3 pawns, Bishop is 3 pawns, Rook is 5 pawns, and Queen is 9 pawns. The King does not have a value as he is worth the entire game. The knight is worth three pawns? How? I'm not sure how that works. The value of pieces can be used to inform what moves you should and shouldn't make. Which piece should you take? Oh! I think I kind of get it. Okay, so let's think about this, because no matter what we do, we're going to wind up putting our knight in a position where it can and will be captured. However, hmm. 
This is a tricky one. If I take... How about this? Knight is three pawns, bishop is three pawns, rook is five pawn, pawns, and queen is nine pawns. If I move to either, I mean, does it want me to capture anyway? I guess so. Sometimes you will need to weigh up whether to make it, take an opponent's piece and re return, place your attacking piece in danger of also being taken. This is called sacrificing. Remember the values of the pieces. Knight is worth three pawns, bishop is worth three pawns, rook is worth five pawns, and queen is worth nine pawns. I still don't understand what it means by sacrifice. The value of pieces can be used to inform what moves you should and shouldn't make. So, for instance... The queen... can move diagonally. Either one of these could make a move. But no matter what we do, the knight will take it. Just once in each game, you are allowed to make a special move involving your king and one of your rooks. This is called castling. It is the only time in chess that you can move two of your pieces together in a single turn. It is also the only time your king can move more than one square in a single turn. If neither the king or the rook have moved from their starting squares and the path between them is empty, then it is possible to castle. The king cannot be in check and cannot move into check. Castling on the right side of the board is called kingside castling and is written down as 0-0 or 0-0. Perform the move now by moving your king to g1. Queen side. Castling on the left of the board is called queen side castling and is written down as zero zero zero. Oh, I see. Pawn promotion is a really important idea in chess. The basic idea is that if a pawn reaches the opponent's back rank, it can be replaced with any piece except a king. We say the pawn has promoted. You can choose any piece you like to replace the pawn. However, it usually pays to promote to a new queen, as the queen is such a powerful and valuable piece. Perform the move g7q to promote the pawn to a queen. Even if you are only just starting, you should know about the, the sneaky unpassant rule. You might trick other beginners who don't notice this pawn capture is possible. Only pawns can capture or be captured unpassant and only then in very specific circumstances. The rule says that if your opponent's pawn moves two squares from its starting position, then you may capture it with one of your pawns as if it had just moved one square, or as if it had moved just one square. However, you can only make this capture on the very next move. If you choose to make another move, then the chance for an unpassant capture is gone. 
Black has just moved his pawn two squares from f7 to f5 to threaten your queen. Capture Black's pawn on passant now by moving your pawn at e5 to f6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So... Like this? Oh! The fork. A move which creates two threats is called a fork. When you play a fork, it doesn't matter if your opponent sees that you are attacking his pieces. Your opponent cannot rescue both of his attacked pieces. All pieces can create forks, but knights and pawns are especially good at it. Can you spot the strong knight fork for white here? Hmm. I think I get it. Is that it? What? Okay, is there something I'm doing wrong? Pin occurs when a defending move cannot offend. Sorry, a pin. <clears throat> a pin occurs when a defending piece cannot move because it would expose a more valuable piece to attack. Some pins are almost harmless, but others are crushingly strong. Pin the black queen against the black king using the white bishop at a4. Like this? Or like...
Okay, am I doing something wrong? Pin the black queen against the black king. One of these tiles has to do it. Pin the black queen against the black king using the white bishop at a4. What does it mean? What do you want from me? Man, some of these lessons I have not done before. So pardon me for kind of being sucky. Oh. Oh, I see. A skewer occurs when two enemy pieces are attacked along a rank, file, or diagonal. When the move more when the more valuable piece in the front moves out of the way, the piece behind is captured. It is the reverse of a pin. Wait, so a skewer occurs where two enemy pieces are attacked along a rank, file or diagonal. When the more valuable piece in the front moves out of the way. Oh, Just like pins, a skewer can only be carried out by pieces that move in a straight line. Yeah. The first part of a chess game is called the opening. There are many different possible chess openings. The objectives are usually the same. Develop the pieces to useful squares. Try to gain influence in the center of the board. Get the king safe. Watch the following sequence of moves from an opening known as the Italian game, where the three important aims are put into practice. A huge amount of knowledge, opening theory, has built up around the openings. Many players have a favorite opening system and books on openings are very popular. A good tip is not to bring the queen and rooks out into the game too early. You might be giving a target to your opponent's minor pieces. Watch the following sequence of moves as an example of how things can go wrong if you do not follow solid principles. While white is taking pieces, the white queen eventually gets pinned, a complete disaster. All because of White's terrible opening development. So here's what's not what not to do.
The Boring Opening. Don't be fooled by the title. This is an excellent opening for amateur players who do not know a lot of chess theory or have limited time to study. It's easy to learn and at the same time solid and aggressive play that keeps Black's counterplay to a minimum, thus boring your opponent. White's opening move is d4. Play that move now. Black will often reply with what is known as King's Indian Defense and play nf6. Alright, and f3. B, f4. Complete the opening with e3. After 10 to 15 moves, the opening is over and the middle game begins. The middle game calls for clever maneuvering as both players try and gain small advantages in position. One of the most important things is to think ahead. Try to anticipate what your opponent might play in response to your moves. Also keep a lookout for a combination, a series of forcing moves that might, might win you pawns or pieces. Watch this short combination where white wins the pawn. Both white and black lose a knight in the process, and black also loses a pawn because the black pawn at d5 is being attacked in combination with the white knight at, at c3 and the white rook at d1. This sacrificial idea was first recorded in 1619 and has been played thousands of times since. It's now an important but still elementary part of every player's chess arsenal. Begin by forcing the Black King out of his safety castle position with the move BX H7. Okay. Note that the following factors make this sacrifice viable. 1. A white bishop on the b1h7 diagonal ready to sacrifice itself. 2. A white knight on f3 poised to jump to g5 and hunt the black king once exposed. 3. A white queen on d1 ready to follow the knight to g4 or h5. 4. White's dark squared bishop on c1 guards the g5 square. The g5 square and allows the knight safety, as well as making h6 a bad place for the black king to run. 5. White's pawn on e5 keeps black defenders and king off f6. If all of these factors exist, then a bishop's sacrifice has a great chance of success. Black now responds taking the bishop and the sacrifice begins to play out. Make the move ng5 plus and watch the king retreat into his hole. Okay. QH5. QF7 plus. QH5 plus. Uh, okay. QH eight plus Q 
QG, QXG7. A transformation takes place once the endgame is reached. In endgames, there are a few dangerous pieces left on the board. This means your king can and should be used actively. King and queen versus king is the most common simple endgame. It is an easy win, but you must know how to win it. Watch this king and queen versus king endgame play out. It is often easier to drive the king back with restricting moves rather than checking moves, but watch out for accidental stalemate. Triangulation sounds complicated, but in truth describes a very simple strategy. It calls for you to step to the side with your king before coming forward. This allows you to turn the move over to your enemy and the opposition over to you. Look at this endgame scenario. White would win if it were back black to move since 1. Ke5 since 1, Ke5 and 2. Ke3 gives white the opposition and leads to the win of the e4 pawn. I know a lot of this sounds really confusing, but it'll make a lot more sense when we play the actual game without all the explanations. And now, we play a game next time. <laughs>